theyeshiva.net. This evening's lecture and learning is dedicated in honor of a complete and speedy recovery for Yitzchak Yehuda ben Miriam, our beloved Rabbi Isaac Moritz, for a refua shleim, a refua kreva, a full, whole, and speedy and complete recovery, many, many long, happy, healthy, joyous, prosperous years. The evening is also dedicated in the loving memory of Stan Davidson, Shlomo ben Moshe. It's also dedicated in the loving memory of Rabbi Treger, Rafal ben Avraham, as well as in the loving memory of Jonathan Bernstein, Yehuda ben Moshe. And finally, dedicated in the loving memory of our dear friends, Reb Tzvi and Itti Ainsworth, who were taken in the catastrophe of Surfside, Florida. May all of their souls be bound up in the internal in the eternal source of life and continue to serve as eternal sources of light, blessing, inspiration to their families, to their loved ones, to their communities, and to all of us, the entire Jewish people and the world. Amen. And thank you so, so much for your generosity, partnership, and friendship. You know, the Talmud says that uh, Rabbi, one of the great sages, his name was Rabbi, before he would begin his class, his lecture, he would always begin with an anecdote. So allow me to do the same. A 60-year-old man goes to the doctor for a checkup. The doctor tells him, whoa, you are in terrific shape. There's absolutely nothing wrong with you. You have the body of a 17-year-old. Amazing, amazing. By the way, some healthy genes in your family. Tell me, how old was your father when he passed away? And the 60-year-old responds and says, why do you think he passed away? My father's not dead, he's alive. The doctor says, wow, that's amazing. How old is your father? And is he active? And the 60-year-old responds, yeah, absolutely. My father is 84 years old. He's still going strong. He's as healthy as an ox. In fact, he goes skiing three times a season. And not only that, three times during the summer, he goes surfing. He's amazing. The doctor can't believe it. He says, could you tell me how old your grandfather was when he died? The 60-year-old says, who told you that my grandfather is dead? He's alive and well. The doctor is astonished. He says, you mean to tell me you're 60 years old and your father and your grandfather are alive? Is your grandfather also active? He says, absolutely. My grandfather, he goes skiing at least once a season. He goes surfing once a week during the summer. He actually still runs his grocery store the way he has done for nine decades. Not only that, my grandfather is 99 years old. And you know, he's a widower for quite a few years. And next week, he's getting married again. The doctor says, at 99 years old, why on earth would your grandfather want to get married? And the patient looks up at the doctor and says, who said he wants to? His mother is putting tremendous pressure on him. We are a nation that cherishes life, believes in life. Moses tells the Jewish people during the last days of his life, there are two paths in this world. There's the path of life, there's the path of death. Ubachar tabachayim, you should choose life. Now, you don't usually have to tell people to choose life over death. A functional, healthy person wants life. What is Moses telling them? But perhaps in the long sojourn of the Jewish people throughout history, Moses knew that Jews can easily develop a culture of death. If anybody should have become suicide bombers, it should have been the Jews who suffered so much and sometimes martyred them becomes the best viable option. But that never happened. 
We were always loyal to the commandment of Moses, choose life at every juncture, and even in times of profound uncertainty and extraordinary grief and sadness. The Jewish people had it in their DNA to stand up and say, we choose life. It's one of the old jokes, pretty good one. The rabbi and the minister and the priest who go out to Starbucks to talk about what they would like to hear people say at their funeral. And the priest says, I would love to hear somebody say he was a true servant of the Lord. He introduced the light of God into many people's lives. And the minister says, I would like to hear somebody say at the funeral, he was a real friend. You can trust him. You can rely on him. He was there for you during hard times. Rabbi, how about you? What would you like to hear somebody say at your funeral? The rabbi says, I would love to hear somebody say, you know, I think he's moving. It's a joke, but it reflects something very authentic about our people. The Jewish people are in love with life. It's not just because we like living. People like living, thank God. But it's because in Judaism, life is sacred. Life is of absolute non-negotiable value. It's hard for us to fathom a tyrant, a dictator, a culture, a philosophy, a religion, a tribe, a people that embraces death over life. It's hard for most Jews in Israel to understand what would be the motivation of a terrorist who comes to Be'er Sheva and in cold blood murders four innocent Jews whose only sin is that Jewish blood is flowing in their sinews and would kill more if he wasn't shot by two people who were alert last week. And then in Chadera just yesterday, a terrorist guns down two people, six people wounded. It's hard for us to wrap our heads around. Why would you want to take somebody else's life and lose your life in the process? or end up in prison, forfeit your future. What goes into people's minds that the joy, the ultimate purpose of your life is to kill somebody else? And that's your glee, that's your mission statement. It's something really unfathomable to the Jewish mind, which is why we come up with all types of distorted explanations and sometimes blame ourselves. It's so pathetic. We sometimes blame ourselves because we, how do you make sense out of this? Nobody wants to die. Nobody wants to kill other people. Well, we sometimes have to sober up to reality. What would motivate the leader of a country to declare war when he was unprovoked and cause senseless deaths? It's very hard for us to understand. It's part of human history. And the consciousness of Mashiach, the consciousness of Geul is that our job as Jews is to introduce a new consciousness into, world, into the world, which is not really a new consciousness. Consciousness, It's the most ancient of consciousness. It's the consciousness of unity, the consciousness of oneness, the consciousness that we are all connected. And for me to win, you also need to win. Because if you lose, I also lose. And if I lose, you also lose. It's like limbs in a body. Imagine somebody says, eh, you can amputate every part of me. I don't care. My, my, as long as you leave my, light, my right arm intact. There's no such a thing. It's all, we're all one. It's like the brain says, I couldn't care less what happens to my leg, what happens to my kidneys, what happens to my liver, my pancreas. Obviously, this person is very sick if they speak this way. So the Jerusalem Talmud in the Darim says that this is a metaphor for all of us as Jews. We're limbs of one body and by extension, the entire planet and the entire cosmos and universe is saturated with oneness. Hashem Echad, God is one, doesn't only mean there's one God and there's no 20 gods or 100 gods or 1,000 gods. It's not only negating polytheism, but it's also saying something deeper. The definition of Hashem is Echad. The definition of godliness, of God, is oneness. In other words, how do I know I'm in a God space, I'm in a divine space, when I'm living in a space of oneness, when I'm living in a space of harmony? First of all, harmony with myself. Second of all, harmony with my spouse, or my friends, my loved ones, my family, my children, my community, and really with the world, there's a sense of oneness and harmony. To be in divine space means to be in a space of oneness. To be in a space where there's real fusion, there's real synthesis, harmony, and integration. And therefore, life is so precious by the Jewish people. Life is seen as sacred and as an opportunity to turn this world into what we were created to turn this world for, into. 
part of the very purpose of creation. But here we come to the next step, which is our primary conversation today, and that is the way Judaism views what happens during the time of resurrection, Tchiyas HaMesim. And this is well worth it to explore, and I know many of you have learned a uh, very profound discourse by the Lubavitcher Rebbe from the year 1986 that was said on the Shabbos Acherei Mois, Tavshin Memvov, right after Pesach. And I had the privilege of being there, being present. I was a young boy. I was after my bar mitzvah, but I was a pretty young boy. But I will always remember that. The Rebbe would say a Hasidic discourse at almost every fabring and every gathering. Most of, the, most of the presentations, the sermons, the lectures were discussing. It could be a passage in Rashi or Zohar or Maimonides or Talmud, or Jewish law, or the portion of the week, or the holiday of the time, or any subject under the sun and above the sun. But there was one segment of the Rebbe's gatherings that in the tradition of the Chabad masters was a mimer. And a mimer was a segment of time, could be 20 minutes, could be an hour, sometimes more, sometimes less, that focused on a profound theme in Judaism, particularly in Jewish mysticism, Jewish spirituality in the works of Kabbalah, the works of the Hasidic masters. It could be the soul, the sephiris, the divine attributes, understanding the spiritual science of the universe, understanding the spiritual psychology and anatomy of the human organism, understanding the essence of Torah, the essence of mitzvahs, understanding the essence of history, understanding the relationship between the human being and God. These types of themes and topics, or also Geula, Mashiach, or, in that case, the Maimer began with the concept of Kol Yisrael Yeshlem Lahoven Inyan Chiyas HaMesim to understand the very theme of the resurrection of the dead. What is the resurrection of the dead? What is this faith? Do we believe in it? Don't we believe in it? Is this a Jewish concept? Some people think it's a Christian concept. What is going to happen? What do we know about it? What don't we know about it? So in my remaining time, I want to give a brief and concise presentation. I have to say that it's brief and concise because this is really a, a, a heavy topic and there's a lot of discussion on this in this discourse that you learned from 1986, many other discourses and talks, and in the works of the Zohar, the foundational work of Kabbalah, in the works of the Medrash, we have about it in the Mishnah in Sanhedrin and in the Talmud Sanhedrin, the 11th chapter, and many other sources in Jewish philosophy and in Jewish mysticism, and in Jewish thought that deals with the resurrection of the dead. It's not the most extensive topic in Judaism, that's certain, but it's quite extensive when you go back to the sources. So what I'm going to do with the grace of God is just give a little summation of some key points that deal with the resurrection. As you always, at the end, we'll have some time for questions and answers, so you can uh, probably type in your questions, questions and answers, or comments, and... Um, we can delve a little deeper into it, especially if there are things that are unclear. The basic belief of Judaism is there is resurrection of the dead. In fact, Maimonides, who lived in the 12th century, was born in Spain, escaped to Morocco from the Almohads, moved to Israel for a time, and then ultimately relocated to Egypt and became the private doctor of uh, Saladin, the great and world-renowned uh, sultan of Egypt, and passed away in the year 1204 or 1205, December, Chavtevis. Maimonides was one of the greatest uh, philosophers in the Jewish world, and somebody who uh, established in a very clear way the principles of Jewish faith. And one of the 13 principles of Jewish faith is, Ani Mam, and I believe, in Tchiyas HaMesim in the resurrection of the dead. What is the resurrection of the dead? We spoke last time about the afterlife. A soul doesn't die. A soul can't die. A soul is life. A soul is godly. God doesn't die. God is the source of life. God is the essence of life. A soul is a fragment of God. A soul is a derivative of the infinite consciousness of God. So a soul never dies. A soul lives for eternity. What is death? Death is not the death of the person's soul. The soul lives on forever. Death is the separation between the soul and the body. 
I gave a metaphor in the previous class, which is not the best metaphor, but it's somewhat of a metaphor. Imagine a refrigerator. Somebody says, when you unplug a refrigerator, electricity dies. No, no, electricity doesn't die. It just retreats back to its source, and it's not manifested, it's not flowing through the refrigerator. Birth is that the soul is manifested through the body. When a person passes away, it's not like the soul dies. No. In fact, in some ways, the soul is more alive after death than before death. And the reason is because what is life really about? If life is about consciousness, if life is about awareness, if life is about love, if life is about compassion, connection, relationships, sensitivity, oneness, authenticity, truth, integrity, all of these qualities, wisdom, perception, vision, awe, reverence, compassion, all of these qualities, the soul lives and experiences much more after death because it's not being filtered through the limited medium, through the limited tool of the body. The vision of the soul is not being limited and filtered through the physical eye. Or the perception of the soul is not limited through the physical ear or through the limited finite brain. The love of the soul is not limited through the physical heart. The wisdom of the soul is not limited via the finite brain with its own parameters and limitations. So the consciousness, the life of the soul is actually intensified much more. For us down here, it's a tragedy because we like the physical contact. I want to be able to touch you. I want to be able to see you. I want to be able to feel you in a very visceral way. I want to be able to hear you. I want to be able to smell you. I want to be able to connect to you in a visceral, concrete way. But in terms of the soul itself, the soul lives on for eternity. The soul is life. The soul is divine life. God doesn't die. The soul doesn't die. And that's why in Judaism, there's a paradox when it comes to death. On one hand, the Judaism says we mourn, we grieve. We don't just say, oh, the soul is alive. It's all good. No, we rent our garments and we sit shiva. Nobody should experience that. And there's a whole year of mourning, 12 months of mourning when somebody, God forbid, loses a parent or another loved one. There is a period of mourning and it's very serious in Judaism. We don't just say, okay, the soul is eternal. I'll see you in the next world. On the other hand, Judaism always focuses on the fact that even the mourning and the grief is prescribed by Jewish law. Why? Because there's a sensitivity to the soul. We don't want to make the soul crazy. We want to also let the soul journey freely. We don't want to, uh, 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 what's it called, shackle, you know, chain down the soul. So this, this paradox is always there in Judaism. So while we cry, we can also laugh. And as we sob, we also dance. Not because we're naive, but because there is this paradox knowing that the soul lives. And the soul lives in an even more intensified way. And the soul grows. And the soul, ex- the soul continues to love and to be connected. And to pray and to care for all those that it left behind. And we celebrate that. And we're in tune with that. And we know that we could still be there for the soul and help the soul. And yet, there's also the element of sadness that doesn't go away. I remember it was once before Pesach, before Passover... Still get emotional when I remember when I think about it. It was Yud Aleph Nissan, 1983, I think. The 11th of Nissan, the Rebbe, the Lubavitcher Rebbe, commemorated commemorates commemorated his birthday. He was born 11 Nissan, April 1902, in Ukraine, Nikolaev, <laughs> the country that the whole world is looking at. He was born in Nikolaev and he was raised in the, he was raised in the Dnepro Petrovsk. And the Rebbe then was speaking about the four questions on Passover. And he said that our tradition is that before the child asks the four questions, we give a little intro. Tata, ich will bei dir fragen, the fear kashas. Father, I'm going to ask you four questions. And he said that the custom of his ancestors and of the predecessors, the previous rebbes, was that even after their father has passed on, they would still give this introduction. Father, I'm going to ask you four questions. And he says, but why? The father is not there anymore. And this is when he, he broke down crying and he said, because when they said, Father, I'm going to ask you the four questions, their father's soul was actually present. Their father's soul came from where it was, where it is in the heavenly abode, in the spiritual abode, and comes to the Seder table. So you could say, Father, 
And he said, it's not a simple thing. It's not a simple thing just to take out a soul from the world of truth. You don't just do it, uh, you know, as a matter of fact thing. Why not? It's a very serious thing. But he says, that was, that's part of the Seder experience, that a child has to be able to turn to his father or her father and say, Father, I want to ask you my questions. Father, I want to ask you four questions. I, the emotions, when he said it, was very intense. The Rebbe started to cry. Perhaps he was also thinking about his own father. And his asking the four questions to his father, his father-in-law, and his father he hasn't seen from when he was a very young man and he had to leave the USSR in the 1920s and he never met his father again. His father died in exile in Kazakhstan. He was Stalin, Stalin arrested him and exiled him, etc. He died in 1944. But in any case, the soul continues to remain connected. But there is a void. And the void is, I can't see it with my eyes, I can't feel it with my visceral body. And now there's something called resurrection. So the soul passes, the person passes, separation of the soul and body. The body gets interred, of course, into the earth. And the soul continues to live in the bosom of God, if you wish. Birth is God exhaling, exhaling. Vayipach ba'apav, he blew the soul into the nostrils of Adam and Eve. And then death is God inhaling, right? Because the soul is neshama, comes to the word neshima, it's divine breath. The divine breath fills the body and then God inhales and the divine breath goes back to its source. And the body is interred into the earth according to the customs and the laws of Jewish tradition. God tells Adam in Genesis, offer atav al offer tashuf. You are, you are earth, you're dust and you're going to return to the soil, you're going to return to the earth and to the dust. And it's a mitzvah to bury a deceased person as you know. So what happens after death? The Neshama is in a space we call Gan Eden. Gan Eden is usually translated as the Garden of Eden or Paradise. But don't confuse it with some, you know, <laughs> some nice kosher, <laughs> kosher restaurant where the soul sits and sips ice, ice coffee all day. Maybe. <laughs> there was once a Jew, a rabbi, his name was Rabbi Quint, and he wrote a book. He was a Torah scholar, and he writes in the introduction that all he wants in paradise is, he wants a shtender. He wants a shtender, like the pulpit of a rabbi, and a Talmud on it, and it should be snowing outside, and warm inside, with a fireplace, and he should have a kettle with hot water so he can make himself a cup of tea, and he'll stand at the shtender and learn. That was his conception of paradise, Right? Somebody once said, I think they say in the name of the Baal Shandu, Baal Shandu said, everybody has their own paradise based on what good life looked like. There was a wagoneer, a coachman, and when he envisioned paradise, he said, do you know what paradise looks like? Paradise looks like is my horse is, my horse is healthy, the wagon is sturdy, and the roads are paved. You know, the old wagoneers in third world countries, even not long ago, even today in some third world countries, parts of Ukraine, the horses struggle, they would fall into holes, into ditches, and if it was icy and muddy and there was sleet and slush and ice, it was very dangerous for the horses. So this was the paradise of the coachman. Everybody envisions paradise based on their own perception of what a good life is in this world. But that's where the soul is separated from the body. That's called Ganeid. But then Judaism introduces the concept of Mashiach. Mashiach is when our world down here will be transformed, and not transformed essentially. The world will become what it was always supposed to become. The inner oneness of the universe will emerge. That's called Mashiach. Following Mashiach, Judaism has the belief in Tchiyas HaMesim, the resurrection of the dead, where actually those who have passed on are going to come back to physical life. Now there is an argument I'm going to mention in passing between Maimonides and Nachmanides, between the Rambam and the Ramban, Maimonides lived in the 12th century. Nachmanides Ramban, also from Spain, Rabbeinu Moshe ben Nachman versus Rabbeinu Moshe ben Maimon. Maimonides, Nachmanides. Rambam's father's name was Maimon. Rambam's father's name was Nachman. This is an interesting, fascinating argument and also between other sages. Maimonides believed that the resurrection of the dead is a period where everybody will come back to life and then they will pass on and eternal life is in the spiritual realms. Nachmanides... And most of the Kabbalists disagreed. Most of the views in Jewish mysticism and the Hasidic masters as well, including the Alter Rebbe, the Balatanya, embraced the view of Nachmanides, that the eternal reward and the eternal life is going to be down here. So it's not just going to be Mashiach, the resurrection of the dead following that, and then eternal life in heaven. 
That's the view of Maimonides, because he felt that the eternal reward shouldn't be down here because the body limits everything. The physical world will limit the reward. As he puts it, what can a blind person understand about colors? How can a body experience ultimate, infinite, divine delight? So he says the ultimate reward is up there. The resurrection of the dead is a period, a period in history. But most of the views in Jewish books, as I said, Nachmanides and many other scholars and, and most of the Kabbalists and mystics and the Hasidic masters is that the ultimate reward is down here. The soul coming back into the body, the body being resurrected, and that resurrection is where there is the eternal life, what's called Chayim Nitzchim, eternal life. Now, a few words about the very concept of resurrection because it seems a little weird. <laughs> A little, yeah, to put it mildly, right? Oh, really? Somebody once told me, so all the tombstones are going to move and everybody is coming back to life. Has anybody ever seen that? So it's strange for us. It's difficult for us to wrap our brains around it. But I would like to use an example that's brought in the Talmud. There was a conversation about the resurrection between Cleopatra, the famous Egyptian queen, and Reb Meir, one of the greatest sages in Jewish history. He lived in the second century after the Common Era. It's recorded in Talmud Sanhedrin, page 91, which over there is a discussion about resurrection. The Talmud proves the sources for resurrection in the Bible, in the Torah, and in the prophets, and in the writings. Various verses that intimate the resurrection from a Jewish perspective, which is why we believe in Chiesa Mesim. It's a fundamental concept in Judaism. But why is it a fundamental concept in Judaism? Why is it important? Why is it significant? Let's say the dead don't come back to life. Whether you agree with Nachmanides or not, Maimonides, everybody holds there's resurrection. It's a cardinal principle in Jewish faith. There was a tzaddik in Jerusalem. He was called Rabbi Aryeh Levine. And on his tombstone, if you can visit his tombstone, he asked everybody who comes to his tombstone to read this Ani Maman. I believe in the resurrection of the dead. This is what he wanted people to do at his grave site. They should remember that it's temporary. Why is it fundamental? And how do we relate to it? Rabbi Meir tells Cleopatra, he speaks to her about, he gives a very interesting metaphor. He says, you know, it really is happening every day. It just happens not with people. It happens with a seed. You take a seed, okay? <laughs> you take grain, the seed of grain, a kernel of, of, of wheat or barley or spelt or oats or rye. And, and you could grind it and have flour and turn it into challah, turn it into bread, turn it into a cake and eat it, yeah? What do you do? You take it and you plant it into the earth and it decomposes. It's near Kav, it, it decomposes, it, it rots. And yet what happens after that? What happens is new stalks of grain grow. And instead of having one seed, you got one seed and you get back 10 seeds or five seeds or 20 seeds from one. So Reb Meir says, you put in one and you get 10, it's even better. Resurrection is you put in one and you get back one. But let's say it would have been the other way around. Let's say we would have lived in a world where, uh, I don't know, a person dies, and then, I don't know, a year later, they come back. But when you put in a seed, nothing happens, because we wouldn't eat vegetation and produce. So if I would tell you, somebody's going to take a seed and put it into the earth, okay, <laughs> and it's going to rot away, and you bury it completely, and it's gone, and then suddenly, pss, grain, legumes, vegetables, Trees, fruits, all types of plants, shrubs, flowers. You're crazy. You're a crazy person. We're so used to it, we take it for granted. But it's not something to take for granted. The miracle of vegetation, you put in a seed and what comes from it? We take it for granted because it happens every day. You buy bread in the store. You buy a peach. You buy a plum. You buy a watermelon. You buy a cantaloupe. You buy a... Cartoffel, a potato, a tomato, a kiwi, whatever it is, a grape. Do you recognize what happened? <laughs> How the seed figures it out together with the earth, together with the soil, together with the ear, together with the water, together with photosynthesis. And it produces perfect food that our body, our organism needs to get its gas so that it could replenish its cells and can provide our blood with the oxygen and with the nutrition it needs so that we could live. And not just us, but every other living 
organism, every other living animal in the world, or mammal, or bird, or reptile, or insect, or fish, and all the plants, everything coordinated in this incredible food chain and food web. So Reb Meir said, this happens. You put something into the earth, it doesn't disappear, decomposes, and then something grows. And that's why, by the way, we mentioned the resurrection in the second blessing of the Amidah. Ata Gibor, you are powerful. Mechaye Meisim Ata, you resurrect the dead. It's the blessing dedicated to rain, because it's what rain does. What does rain do? Rain is the water that descends, saturates the earth, and allows the roots to gain the nutrients, the nutrition they need in order for growth to be able to happen after it was buried in the earth. So we finish that blessing, the second blessing of the Amidah. And we say, Mekayim emunasi l'shene afar. Mi chamolcha ba'al gvuris midamalach melech meimis o mechaya o matzmiach Yeshua. You're the king that takes life and brings life back. And salvation grows. V'neman atal hachios meisim. What's this concept? It's one of the reasons we actually bury and we don't cremate. When we bury a corpse, it's not just respect for the corpse. You don't want to burn it. That's also true. But it's also planting. It's the beginning of growth. When you bury a seed, somebody says, what are you doing? It was a good seed. It was a good kernel. What are you doing? You're getting rid of it. No, we're not getting rid of it. I'm planting it. You know, they say in life, sometimes you feel that somebody is burying you. They don't know that you're a seed. When you bury a seed, it doesn't disappear. It comes back with a vengeance. You know, Joseph was buried twice in his life. His brothers threw him into a pit, and Potiphar's wife threw him into a pit. They both didn't know that he was a seed. Oi, did Joseph come back. He brought all the grain back and he fed the whole nation. He fed his brothers, he fed his family. Sometimes in life, you feel like you're being buried. You're being planted. It's there to make you grow. There's a great Hasidic, I love this interpretation. It's a Jikava interpretation. Literally, it means God sustains his faith for those who are sleeping in the earth. Meaning, God is going to fulfill His promise and bring them back to life. But there's also a spiritual idea. God imbues emuna in those who are sleeping while they're alive, as though they were dead. You know what they call a dead man walking? Sometimes a person emotionally is lifeless. I feel like I'm dead. There's no hope. God still believes in you. You may not believe in him, but he still believes in you, even if you don't believe in him. The resurrection of the dead in its physical form happens after Mashiach comes. But the concept of it is a timeless concept in Judaism. It's the vision of Ezekiel chapter 37, I think it is. You remember that vision? We read it on Pesach, we're going to read it soon. The vision of the dry bones, it's an incredible prophecy. Ezekiel goes to a valley and it's full of dry bones. And he tells God, they can't come back to life. And then these very dry bones are imbued with a new sense of life and they all come back to life. It's a vision that captures Jewish history. After Auschwitz and Bergen-Belsen and Chelmich and Treblinka and Dacha, a nation was reduced to dry bones. And even those bones were burnt. Mounds of ashes, six million. Can this come back to life? But the vision of Ezekiel is that resurrection happens constantly throughout Jewish history. There's never a situation that warrants absolute despair and resignation. People looked at themselves, they looked at the Jewish people and they said, it's over. The dry bones, they've, they're finished. They're emaciated. They're skeletons. There's nothing left. But look what happened. The renaissance of the Jewish people. Take Russia and Ukraine. Russia, the Jews suffered in Ukraine like they suffered in no other country in history. Especially during the time of the Holocaust. But already before that. And then communism fell. Do you know how Judaism was resurrected in Ukraine? 
I have a hundred, I know the 183 Chabad Shluchim's families, that's a husband and wife with children, who have built 50 communities in Ukraine, plus some other, uh, other synagogues and amazing organizations that did work in Ukraine. And now working from far, most of them, most of them had to escape to help those Jews who stayed behind and to help the refugees. But every centimeter of Ukraine is drenched with Jewish blood. Bodies everywhere. But you know what? In Jewish Judaism, burial is not the end. It's the end of an era. And it's sad and it's tragic and it's horrible. But it's also the beginning of a new era. We plant. We plant a seed. And that seed is going to rise again. That seed is going to come back. It's going to morph into life after decomposition. And that's why Judaism is not pro-cremation. Because when you cremate a body, the body becomes ash. When buried, the body returns to the soil. It becomes one with the soil. There's a big difference between the two. Soil is fertile. Ash is not. Soil allows for new growth, for further growth, for further life. Ash is barren. Ash is lifeless. Turning the body to ash is unnatural. The gradual process of returning the body to soil is true to the inner meaning of death because the passing of one generation allows the sprouting of another. And the living are nourished and inspired by the legacy of those who are gone. Our forebearers are the soil from which all of us sprout. Even in their death, they are a source of life. And those nutrients, the body remains there. And then there is the ultimate resurrection when the body comes back. And here I'm going to share with you an incredible piece in the Zohar. And the truth is, to our times, it was very hard to understand this. The Zohar says, and this is already says in Midrash, that in the human body, there's one tiny little bone that never, ever gets destroyed. Even the Jews who were burnt in the crematoriums, the millions of Jews who were burnt in the crematoriums, if you go to Treblinka, you could still see Mounds and mounds of ashes. I remember when I took a group of students there. and We were just staring in disbelief. And you could still see little bones. You could still see tiny little particles of bones. And the Midrash and the Zohar teach that there's one little bone. Darizal says it's the place where we tie the head fillin in the back, in the back of the nape. Some connected to the Petrus bone. Or others say it's a certain part of the vertebrae and the spine. There's a discussion about it. And that is indestructible. Whatever happens to the body, even after the body disintegrates and decomposes, even if the body is burnt, that little, little tiny bone is not gone. And the Zohar says from that bone, the Midrash says, and the Zohar say, from that bone, God is going to rebuild the body. The Zohar says it's like a, a sourdough. The starter in a sourdough. Yeah, any, any one of you make sourdough challah? You know how the starter is alive and it affects the whole dough? The Zohar says that this little tiny bone is going to grow like the inflation of the dough from the sourdough, from the starter, from the, the zoyateg, the yeast, the, re, the not real yeast, not fake yeast. If you, if you know about sourdough challah, you know what I'm talking about, the real one, not the fake one. You have to get rid of the starter for Pesach. <laughs> Unless you gift, gift it to a Gentile. So the Zohar says this bone grows and then from there the limbs and the organs and all the aspects of the body come back and the body is resurrected. Now, when we saw, when we see this Zohar and this Medrash, it's very hard to wrap our brain around it. What does it even mean? What does it mean? But today, after we have learned so much about the incredible properties of DNA, we may know what it means. I'm not sure, but I think we may know what it means. Look what happened a few years ago when they cloned Dolly. You remember the sheep Dolly? Now we know the power of the DNA which exists in one cell. And the DNA is the genetic code for the entire organism, for the entire body. So they cloned the sheep. They cloned the sheep. In this genetic, incredible, incredible modern scientific miracle, replicating the original sheep through a single cell. 
Even after we discovered cells, we thought the cell of the eye is not the cell responsible for the skin, for the bone. Today we know, of course, you have 70 trillion cells or 50 trillion cells. And all of them share the identical genetic code, same 46 chromosomes, same 30,000 genes or whatever the accurate number is. And in fact, we have to know how each cell knows, this cell knows it needs to become part of the eye, part of the ear, part of the nose, part of the stomach, part of the skin, part of the bone. And who directs the cell to know where it should go when every single cell has a double copy of the genome, the genetic code which contains the blueprint, the design for the entire organism. So what scientists have learned in our generation to do, you think God can do? So the Zohar says that little bone has DNA. And DNA is found in every part of the body. And we know today in science that if a body is preserved, if a body is preserved in a proper place, DNA can last 10,000 years, hundreds of thousands of years, some say a million years, and some say more. And the DNA which is in every single cell of the body has the blueprint for the entire body so that the whole body can be rebuilt anew. This is something we're learning in our generation in science today. So if a scientist is learning how to do it, do you think that the author of DNA and the author of the universe and the cosmos and the one who gave every scientist and geneticist and biologist his or her wisdom can't do it? Now everybody asks the obvious question. What happens if my soul was here a few times? Most souls today are reincarnations. In other words, my soul may have been here before, may have been here many times. In fact, we carry in ourselves not only our life, we carry many lives. And they impact us in different ways. Now, God doesn't want me to know. I don't have to know who, where my soul was previously. If I have to know, I'll know. (laughs) If I have to know, I'll know. I have enough to figure out my lifetime, my journey this lifetime. I don't have to go back to other lifetimes, even though it's interesting You know, who was I in my previous reincarnation? But the truth is, you have to understand how a soul works. A soul is not a physical, self-contained entity. You know, if you light one flame from another flame, the first flame is not missing anything. You don't say, oh, now the first flame was cut in half. And what happens if you light a hundred flames from the first flame? The first flame is not missing anything. The fire continues to grow. Every aspect of the soul contains within it a whole soul, a totality of a soul, like the flame that you light from another fire. Uh, The way reincarnation works is my soul comes into the body. Certain things it accomplished what it had to accomplish. Certain things it didn't. So the part of the soul that didn't accomplish what it had to accomplish, that comes back down again into a new body. And there may be a part of the soul that comes down into a new body. So by the resurrection of the dead, all of the bodies can be resurrected. And everyone is going to contain that part of the soul that it primarily repaired and fixed during its lifetime. So it's not a competition. Even if a soul came down a few times, all of those bodies could come back to life. And each one will have a full, complete soul because it's not like the soul is split up into pieces. You're dealing with divine energy. So every part of the flame has the whole flame in it. I'm just mentioning this because people often get confused, but this is explained in the Zohar and it's explained in the writings of the Arizal. Who's going to get up in the resurrection? Who? The Mishnah says, you learned this in the discourse, we say it before the ethics of the fathers during the summer months after Pesach. Call Yisrael Yashlam Chelek Olam Haba. All of Israel has a portion in Olam Haba in the world to come. And the world to come here is referring to, not to paradise, it's referring to the resurrection of the dead. There's even a great Kabbalist, Rabbi Meir ben Gabbai, in his book, Avodos HaKodesh, and he says, also the Gentiles, Hasidei Umas HaOlam, the pious ones from among the Gentiles, also have a portion of the world to come. But then the Mishnah continues about people who dedicated their lives to very wicked and heinous choices. And they lose their portion in the world to come. Does this mean that a significant amount of people will not have a portion in the world to come? People are often afraid. Am I going to be one of them? Am I going to be excluded? But the truth is you have to understand something. If a person did tshuva, if a person, even if they did some really not nice things, 
but they repent at any point of their life, they come back to the world to come. They have a part in the world to come. And even if they did repentance on their deathbed, and even if they didn't have a chance to change their actions, but they just had a regret in their heart, that is sufficient for them to merit the world to come. They may have to go through a lot of cleansing. The soul goes through different forms of cleansing, but they have a part in the world to come. Furthermore, our sages say that even if somebody died without repentance, without remorse, without regret, but they have a child, and that child, a son, a daughter, a grandchild, a great-grandchild, is living a good life, they can rescue their father, their mother, their grandparents, because these are the children of this guy. So even if he happened to have been wicked, but the fact is that he left these children and it's the same genes, so they rectify him, especially if they pray for him, if they do a mitzvah for him. So he has a portion of the world to come or she has a portion of the world to come. Even somebody who doesn't have children, if other people pray for them. We have a story in, in the Talmud about Reb Meir and Elisha ben Avuya, Reb Yoichanan, other people pray for them. They can also help the soul come back to the world to come. And the Yerushalmi says even more, Yeruvam ben Evot, Yeruvam ben Evot was a heinous king of Israel. He was a real criminal. He resurrected idolatry. And the Talmud says, the Mishnah says, he doesn't have a portion of the world to come. And the Yerushalmi says that his body, there was a sieges in Israel by the destruction of the first temple and his body was decimated and it was burnt. And the Jerusalem Talmud says after that, he can also come to the, he can also have a portion of the world to come because he went through the penalties and the cleansing that is necessary. And even if you have a person who has none of this and really forfeits the ability to come back in the world to come, the resurrection, the Arizal, the great Kab- and other Kabbalists write, the Shalah, the Arizal, the Rishos Chachma, even their souls will come back, but in a completely new body. Because every soul is a piece of God. It ultimately can't be lost. A, 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 the Jewish soul is a chelik eloika mi ma'al mamish. It's a piece of Hashem. So what, what may happen is that they don't come back in the same body. All others come back in the same body. The body is resurrected. Their soul will come back not in the same body. Why is this so important? Why is this such a fundamental concept in Judaism? So here I'm going to conclude with two points and then we're going to go to questions. Point number one, the Talmud gives a lovely metaphor, Sanhedrin 91. There was a king who had a beautiful uh, garden and a delicious fig tree with the best figs, exquisite figs. And the king put two security guards. One security guard was lame and one was blind. Now the lame person really wanted the figs. Problem is he was lame, he couldn't climb. The blind person also wanted the figs, but the blind person couldn't see. So what happened? The lame and the blind came together and the blind person picked up the lame person, put him on his shoulders and the lame person picked the figs, and they both ate them together. When the king came back and he sees all the figs are gone, he says, what happened to my figs? Who? Who? Who is guilty? And the lame guy said, can't be me. You know I can't. I can barely walk. I can't climb. Blind says, blind person says, can't be me. I can't see. The king was wise. He says, you know what? We'll put the lame person on the blind person and punish them together. The soul says, I couldn't sin. <laughs> I don't have a body. What am I supposed to do? The body says, me? I'm directionless. I'm just a corpse. So just like the punishment comes together, the reward has to come together. You can't just reward the soul and forget about the body. On the contrary, the body worked hard. Our whole life in this world is in our body. It's our bodies that do all the mitzvahs. The soul can't do any mitzvah without the body. The soul can't even study or pray without the body. You can't just let the body die and it just decomposes. So the ultimate reward is not just the body, not just the soul. It's the soul and the body. It goes one step deeper. And this is one of the main focuses in this discourse that you learned about the resurrection of the dead. The ultimate purpose of creation was that there should be complete oneness between God and the human being. Complete integration and oneness, not just on a spiritual level, but on physical earth in the physical body. Is that never going to happen? Paradise is the soul without a body. Mashiach is a beautiful world, 
But what about all the people who lived thousands of years? Are their bodies just finished and gone? The resurrection of the dead is the ultimate realization of creation, where the body comes back to what it truly was. Why does a body have to die now? Why does godliness have to die? Once Adam and Eve ate from the tree and they created dissonance between the soul and the body, now the body is mortal. With the resurrection, the body is going to become that same body that was there originally in the beginning of creation, a conduit for God. And if it's a conduit for God, the body is eternal just like the soul is eternal. And the ultimate realization of oneness is realized through the soul and the body together for eternity. <laughs> the last point I'm going to make is something we once heard from the Lubavitcher Rebbe. It was such a beautiful idea. I think he only said it once, fast and passing. I never, I never saw it again. He said it once on the yard side of his father. You know, I should really look it up again because it's, it's worthwhile disseminating. I don't think I ever taught this. I, but I, I heard it once from the Rebbe and it left such an impact. He said as follows, the rewards in Judaism are not random rewards. It's like, you do something for me in the office, I give you a paycheck. The rewards are actually generated by the work. It's a very different type of reward. Schar mitzvah mitzvah. The reward of the mitzvah comes from the mitzvah itself. The mitzvah itself generates its reward. The Rebbe said, what's the purpose of all the Torah and mitzvahs? What do we do in this world? You know what we do? We take something that's lifeless and we make it alive. Because the physical world on its own is lifeless. The world on its own has no life. Tell me, all of matter is made up of atoms. Millions, billions, trillions, zillions, sectillions, beyond what our mind could fathom. All working in perfect harmony. The nucleus of the atom. The electrons revolving. And the same is true about every single tiny piece of matter. It's unfathomable. Every cell is made up of the atoms and every neuron. And every component of matter is made up of atoms. And there's a life force and it's a divine life force. Without divinity, nothing could live. And as the Baal Shem Tov says, it's recreated every single moment. When a Jew does a mitzvah, what does he or she do? They bring to life the physicality. You reveal the divine energy in the physical. For example, if I'm drinking a cup of coffee, or a cup of tea, or a cup of water. What do I say before? Baruch atah Hashem alekeinu melech ha'olam shahakol niya bidvare. Blessed are you God, the king of the world, for everything came into existence through his word. What's the connection? Before you drink a cup of water, what do you do? You make a statement, you become aware that water is divine energy. It's a manifestation of the divine energy. The H2O, the two atoms of hydrogen and oxygen, it's ultimately divine energy, divine consciousness. Or as Max Planck used to say, we used to think consciousness is a derivative of matter. Today we know matter is a derivative of consciousness. So with every mitzvah, what do we do? We invigorate the physical universe. We bring out the inner spiritual consciousness, the life of it. So what's the reward for Torah and mitzvahs? That this happens to us also. The physical comes back to life. The mitzvah takes what seems like a lifeless world. It does seem like a world that's divorced from the divine. We don't see the divine. And brings out the life of the divine. And that's the reward of the resurrection of the dead. May God... Grant us that all of us, with our own eyes, should be able to experience the coming of Mashiach, followed, as the Zohar says at a later period, by the resurrection of the dead, to be able to see it with our eyes, to be able to re-experience that ultimate oneness of ourselves and all of our loved ones and past generations. As the Talmud says, Moses will come and Aaron will come and all of our beloved ones of all the generations will come. May it be speedily in our days. Thank you very much. We'll take some questions. Rabbi Jacobson, uh, thank you once again for uh, this this evening, but uh, a number of questions have come through, if I could. Sure, uh, please. Let's try and, try and put a couple of them together um, so that we can see if we can... Uh, 
Absolutely. We'll get some answers that you haven't addressed because some of the questions came through as you were talking and some of the stuff has already been covered. Um, a question that came through is um, if everybody's going to be resurrected, so perhaps a very practical one, um, is there anything about where they'll all be housed? Where will everybody go? Number two is um, what happens if a person has uh, had more than one spouse and um, the which uh, or the, the question actually was phrased, if they've actually lost two spouses, which one will they be reunited with, or uh, how will that all Okay, beautiful questions. In terms of housing, what I would suggest is that we should rely on the creator of the world, and he'll provide the housing, you know, just like he created this planet, and you know that uh, from a logical perspective, from a big bang this planet should have not been here supporting life. So I think, you know, we could trust God that the housing will be uh, just comfortable, just comfortable, in fact, as comfortable as in South Africa. Uh, Unlike, uh, I grew up in Brooklyn, the housing was a little tighter. (laughs) But it's going to be even better than the space, uh, space that you have in South Africa. Number one, in terms of marriage, that's a very, very good question. So I have never seen it addressed. I have to do some more research. What I would say is as follows. This is the time of the ultimate bliss. So you can be rest assured that God will ensure that everyone comes out happy. So a person says, he had a first wife. He had a second wife. Both bodies come. Who is he marrying? Whatever happens, however it works out, everybody is going to feel extraordinarily content and satisfied. There's not going to be a woman or a man feeling, it's not fear, not fear, you stole, you stole her, give her back to me. The story of Cain and Abel, the first murder happened because Abel was born with another sister and Cain said it belonged to me and he killed. That's the beginning of history. At the end, everybody will emerge perfectly content, however God works it out. So don't worry about it. Rabbi, a further question is, how long, what sort of time span is there? Mashiach comes, when does the resurrection take place? The Zohar, the Zohar writes, the Zohar says that it's going to happen 40 years after Mashiach comes. That's what the Zohar says. Mashiach comes, the Beis HaMikdash is built, all the exiles go back to the Holy Land, and 40 years later is the resurrection of the dead. Um, there's even an order that the Zohar discusses those who died in, in the Holy Land, who are buried in the Holy Land, and those who died and buried outside the Holy Land, and those uh, from, the, from, the, from the desert, etc., etc. And the last ones are the patriarchs and the matriarchs, so that when they come back, they have the nachas. They see everybody is already there, sitting at the Shabbos table, peacefully, eating chicken soup and singing nicely together and not fighting. It does, however, say in the Talmud and in the Zohar that there are special souls, tzaddikim, who may be resurrected immediately. Because the Talmud says that when the Jews need to rebuild the third base Samikdash, they will be able to consult with Moses and with Aaron, Moshe and Aaron. So the, our sages say that some of the great, great souls, some of the great tzaddikim may, uh, may be resurrected early, early on, right away, immediately. And other sources say, by extension, since the exile has lasted so long, thousands of years, almost 2,000 years, va'amich kulam tzaddikim, all the souls have been refined to the point of absolute righteousness. Or some say that even the resurrection doesn't have to wait 40 years even for the other Jews because everybody's in a state of great righteousness today. So we don't have an exact date or an exact thing, just like we don't have a date for Mashiach. We wait every day for Mashiach. And, uh, you know, I grew up with the song, We Want Mashiach Now. We wait for it all day because God can do it any moment, any day, but ultimately the exact timeline is up to the creator of the world. A number of people have asked, um, Rabbi, perhaps we'll make this uh, the last question, but a number of people have asked about uh, two, uh, perhaps a, a, a two-phased uh, question. Uh, number one is cremations, and um, is there hope for resurrection after a cremation, in terms of is done willingly, I guess? And the second thing is, um, what about uh, non-Jews? Is there anything about uh, non-Jews being resurrected? Um, Excellent question. Uh, and, and perhaps a double barrel there, if non-Jews were cremated, how does that work? Yeah. Excellent, excellent question. So first let me talk about cremation. 
So as I said earlier in the lecture, Judaism encourages, there's a mitzvah to bury, and we don't cremate bodies, and there's a reason for it. It's disrespectful to the mourners, it's, it's disrespectful to the, to the dead, it's not natural for the body, there's a very big difference. As I said, part of it is because it's the planting, it's the beginning of the resurrection. I should also say something else, and I'm not saying this, I know there are those who, whose parents were cremated, I've read the, some of the comments, and I know some of you, so at this point, but I, I'm saying this for those who sometimes think about cremation, you know, why not, let, let me just cremate my parents, it's cheaper, it's easier, I don't have to deal with a plot, I don't do with a tombstone, I just want to tell you something that I think is important to know. In 1983, on the 4th of Tavis, um, somebody wrote to the Rebbe about somebody who wants to be cremated after death. And the person consulted the Rebbe, the Lubavitcher Rebbe, what to tell this person. The Rebbe wrote a very painful answer. And I feel it's, it's not so comfortable to share, but it's important to share. He said it's important to understand and explain to a person that the body still has a form of life even after the soul leaves. As long as the body is not completely decomposed, which takes time, the body still has some of the energy of the soul and it has some life form. And part of the soul is connected to the body. So when somebody says, I want to cremate my body, who cares? It's actually, you're not just cremating a dead body. You're also cremating a little part of the neshama, which is always alive. So it's like burning somebody who's alive, but only partially, which is something that we're unaware of. So we do it by mistake. We don't realize. But if we would know what it is, the Rebbe says, it's cruelty. And even if you decide it for yourself, I want to burn my own soul. It doesn't make a difference. It's still cruel. And the fact that many people do it, the Rebbe says, that doesn't justify it. Now, many people don't know this, so they do it innocently. So as I told you, there is always a little tiny particle bone that remains. It's called the loose bone. It's some loose. I told you some people associate it with the nape where we put the knot of the tefillin on the head or with a certain part of the spine or the vertebrae. But that little bone remains even with cremation and therefore they can also experience resurrection. It would help when you have people, close ones who, are res who were cremated, to learn something in their honor, to give charity in their honor, to do mitzvahs in their honor, to help the elevation of their soul. We should all do it for our loved ones, but especially in this situation. And the same is true with all the Jews who were burnt. The six million who were burnt, of course they have resurrection. All of them have resurrection because the bone remains. And also non-Jews, I mentioned earlier, there is a view in Kabbalah. Rabbi Meir ben Gabai, 15th century great Kabbalist, that the pious ones of the Gentiles, somebody wrote, is Hitler going to be resurrected? No, you don't have to worry about Hitler. And you don't have to worry about Stalin. And you don't have to worry about Chmelinetsky and Alfred Rosenberg and Eichmann and Himmler and Mengele and, uh, and the Khomeinis and Titus and Vespasian and Paro you don't have to, and Haman. You don't have to worry about them. They're not going to roam the planet. But Hasidi Yom the pious one from amongst, among the Gentiles, there's a very fascinating view in Kabbalah that they will also experience resurrection. I just want to say, because somebody wrote something very heartfelt, um, uh, they said that they have a Christian family who had a daughter, who had her own late daughter cremated last October, and the mother converted to Judaism, and she's been tormented by what's going to happen to her daughter. So you don't have to be tormented by this, because people make decisions. You were not Jewish at the time. They're not Jewish at the time. They made a decision based on their understanding. God is a forgiving God. God is not a, ve God, God is not a vengeful God. We do things. Remember, the six million Jews were cremated. We're not worried that they're not going to be resurrected. God takes care of every soul and brings it to the place it has to be. So please, I hope you could sleep with a little more serenity knowing your daughter is not suffering anymore because of this, especially when you say a prayer for her, you give charity for her, you do good deeds for her. It brings tremendous nachas, tremendous delight to the soul. I just wanted to add that. This class is brought to you by the yeshiva.net. Please help us continue the classes. 
make even a small contribution at www.theyeshiva.net slash donate.